They waited patiently for what seemed like a very long time, stamping their feet in the snow. At last, they heard the sound of slow, shuffling footsteps approaching from the door inside. It seemed, as the mole remarked to the rat, like someone were walking in carpet slippers that were too large for him and down at heel. Which was intelligent of Mole, because that's exactly what it was. There was a noise as the bolt shot back. The door opened a few inches, enough to show a long snout and a pair of sleepy, blinky eyes. Time this happens, said a gruff and suspicious voice. I shall be exceedingly angry. Who is it this time, disturbing people on such a night? Speak up! Oh, badger! cried the rat. Let us in, please! It's me, Rat, and my friend Mole. We've lost our way in the snow. What? Ratty, my dear little man! exclaimed the badger in quite a different voice. Come along in, both of you, at once! Oh. Why, you must be perished! Well, I never! Lost in the snow! And in the wild wood! And at this time of night! Oh. But come on, you two! Two animals tumbled over each other in their eagerness to get inside, and heard the door shut behind them with great joy and relief. The badger, who wore a long dressing gown and whose slippers were indeed very down at heel, carried a flat candlestick in his paw and had probably been on its way to bed when their summons sounded. He looked kindly down on them and patted both their heads. It's not the sort of night for small animals to be out, he said paternally. I'm afraid you've been up to some of your pranks again. Ah, ratty. But come along. Up into the kitchen. There's a first-rate fire in there. And supper. And everything. He shuffled on in front of them, carrying the light, and they followed him, nudging each other in an anticipating sort of way, down a long, gloomy, and, to tell the truth, decidedly shabby passage, into a sort of central hall, out of which they could dimly see other long tunnel-like passages branching, passages mysterious and without apparent end. But there were doors in the hall as well, stout oaken, comfortable looking doors. One of these the badger flung open and at once they found themselves in all the glow and warmth of a large firelit kitchen. The floor was well warm red brick and on the wide hearth burnt a fire of logs between two attractive chimney corners tucked away in the wall, well out of any suspicion of draught. A couple of high back settles facing each other on either side of the fire gave further sitting accommodations for the sociably disposed. In the middle of the room stood a long table of plain boards placed on trestles, with benches down each side. At one end of it, where an armchair stood, pushed back, were spread of remains of the badger's plain but ample supper. Rows of spotless plates winked from the shelves of the dresser at the far end of the room, and from the rafters, overhead hung hams, bundles of fried herbs, nets of onions, and baskets of eggs. It seemed a place where heroes could fitly feast after victory, where weary harvesters could line up in scores along the table and keep their harvest home with mirth and song, and where two or three friends of simple taste could sit about and they pleased and eat and smoke and talk in comfort and contempt. The ruddy brick floor smiled up at the smoky ceiling. The oaken settles, shiny with long wear, exchanged cheerful glances with each other. Plates on the dresser grinned at the pots on the shelf, and the merry firelight flickered and played over everything without distinction. The kindly badgers thrust them down on the settle to toast themselves at the fire, and bade them remove their wet clothes and boots. Then he fetched them dressing gowns and slippers, and himself bathed the mole's shin with warm water, and mended the cut with a stickling plaster, <coughs> till the whole thing was just as good as new, if not better. In the embracing light and warmth, 
warm and dry at last with weary legs propped up in front of them and a suggestive clink of plates being arranged on the table behind it seemed the storm-driven animals now in safe anchorage that the cold and trackless wild wood just left outside was miles and miles away and all that they had suffered in it a half-forgotten dream when at last they were thoroughly toasted badger summoned them to the table where he was busy laying a repast they had felt pretty hungry before but when they actually saw at last the supper that was spreading for them Really, it seemed like the only question was, what should they attack first? It was all so attractive. And whether the other things would obligingly wait for them till they had time to give them attention. Conversation was impossible for a long time. When it was slowly resumed, it was that regrettable sort of conversation that results from talking with your mouth full. The badger did not mind that sort of thing at all. Nor did he take any notice of elbows on the table or everybody speaking at once. As he did not get into society himself, he had, got, he had got an idea that these things belong to things that don't really matter. We know, of course, that he was wrong and took too narrow of a view because they do matter very much. It would take too long to explain why. Sat in his armchair at the head of the table and nodded gravely at intervals as the animals told their story. And he did not seem surprised or shocked at anything. And he never said, I told you so, or that's what I always said. Or remarked that they ought to have done so-and-so or ought to have not to have done something else. The mole began to feel very friendly towards him. When supper was really finished at last and each animal felt that his skin was now as tight as was decently safe, and that by this time he didn't care a hang for anybody or anything, they gathered round the glowing embers of the great wood fire and thought how jolly it was to be sitting up so late and so independent and so full. And after they had chatted for a time about things in general, the badger said heartily, Well then, tell us the news from your end of the world. How's old Toad getting on? Oh... From bad to worse, said the rat gravely, while the mole cocked up on a settle and basking in the free light, his heels higher than his head, tried to look properly mournful. Another smash up only last week, and it's a bad one. If only he'd employ a decent, steady, well-trained animal, get him to do everything, pay him good wages, he'd get on well. But no, he's convinced he's a heaven-born driver and nobody can teach him anything. And all the rest follows how many has he had inquired the badger gloomily smashes or machines asked the rat oh well after all it's the same thing with toad this is the seventh as for others you know that coach house of his well it's piled up literally piled up to the roof with fragments of motor cars none of them bigger than your hat? That accounts for the other six, so far as they can be accounted for. He's been to the hospital three times, put the mole. And as for the fines he's had to pay, it's simply awful to think of. Yes, that's part of the trouble, continued the rat. Toad's rich, we all know, but he's not a millionaire and a hopelessly bad driver. And quite regardless of law, an order. Kills are ruined. It's one of those. Sooner or later. Badger, we're his friends. We need to do something. The badger went through a bit of hard thinking. Now look here, he said at last rather severely. Of course you know I can't do anything now. His two friends assented, quite understanding his point. No animal, according to the rules of animal etiquette, is ever expected to do anything strenuous or heroic or even moderately active during the off-season of winter. All are sleepy, some actually asleep. All are weather-bound, more or less, and all are resting from arduous days and nights, during which every muscle in them had been severely tested and every energy kept at full stretch. Very well, then continued the badger, but 
when once the year has really turned and the nights are shorter and halfway through them one rouses and feels fidgety wanting to be up and doing by sunrise if not before you know what i mean both animals nodded gravely they knew well then went on the badger we that is you and me and our friend the mole here will take toads seriously in hand we'll stand no nonsense whatever We'll bring him back to reason, by force if need be. We'll make him a sensible toad. Well, you're asleep, ratty. Not me, said the rat, waking up with a jerk. He's been asleep two or three times since supper, said the mole, laughing. He himself was feeling quite wakeful and even lively, though he didn't know why. The reason was, of course, that he had been naturally an underground animal by birth and breeding. The situation of Badger's house exactly suited him and made him feel at home, while the rat, who slept every night in a bedroom, the windows of which opened on a breezy river, naturally felt the atmosphere still and oppressive. Boom! It's time we were all in bed. Said the Badger, getting up and fetching flat candlesticks. Come along, you two and I'll show you to your quarters. And take your time tomorrow morning. Breakfast at any hour you please. He conducted the two animals to a long room that seemed half bedchamber and half loft. The badger's winter stores, which indeed were visible everywhere, took up half of the room. Piles of apples, turnips, and potatoes, baskets full of nuts and jars of honey. But the two little white beds on the remainder of the floor looked soft and inviting and the linen on them through course was clean and smelt beautifully of lavender and the mole and the water rat shaking off their garments in some 30 seconds tumbled in between the sheets in great joy and contentment in the accordance with the kindly badger's injunctions the two tired animals came down to breakfast very late the next morning and found a bright fire burning in the kitchen and the two young hedgehogs sitting on the bench at the table eating oatmeal, porridge, and out of wooden bowls. The hedgehogs dropped their spoons, rose to their feet, and ducked their heads respectively as the two entered. There, sit down, said the rat pleasantly. Where have you youngsters come from? Lost in the snow, I suppose? Yes, please, sir, said the elder of the two hedgehogs respectfully. Me and little Billy here, we was trying to find our way to school. Mother would have a school. Was the weather ever so? And of course, we lost ourselves, sir. And, and Billy, he got frightened and took and cried, being young and faint-hearted. And at last, we happened up against Mr. Badger's back door and made so bold as to knock, sir. For Mr. Badger, he's a kind-hearted gentleman, as everyone knows. I understand said the rat, cutting himself some rashers from a side of bacon, whilst the mole cracked egg into a saucepan. And what's the weather like outside? You needn't stir me quite so much, he added. Oh, terrible bad, sir. Terrible deep the snow is, said the hedgehog. No getting out for the likes of you gentlemen today. Where's Mr. Badger? inquired the mole as he warmed the coffee pot before the fire. The master's gone into his study, sir, replied the hedgehog. And he said as how he was going to be particularly busy this morning, and on no account was he to be disturbed. This explanation, of course, was thoroughly understood by everyone present. The fact is, as already set forth, when you live a life of intense activity for six months in the year, and of comparative or actual somnolence for the other six, during the latter period, you cannot be continually pleading sleepiness when there are people about or things to be done. The excuse gets monotonous. The animals well knew that Badger, having eaten a hearty breakfast, had retired to his study and settled himself in an armchair with his legs up on another and a red cotton handkerchief over his face and was being busy in the usual way at this time of the year. The front doorbell clanged loudly and the rat, who was very greasy with buttered toast, 
sent Billy, the smaller hedgehog, to see who it might be. There was a sound of much stamping in the hall, and presently Billy returned in the front of the otter, who threw himself on the rat with an embrace and a shout of affectionate greeting. Get off! Splurted the rat 